Okay, great. So before we actually start, I wanted to show everyone one thing, and then we'll we'll look at the text. So what I have up here, uh, it's somewhat of a plug, but it's you know I'm just no pressure. Okay, but for the for the students here in the Philippines, we have a, a Facebook page called Interpreting the Word, and so uh, we post. Some of you saw the, uh, the notes from last week. Uh, we'll post our, our sessions that we're recording and putting on YouTube. So for example, our last week's session, I put on YouTube for anyone who missed last week, they can watch it. And so we have all this technology, why, should, why aren't we using it? So my plan is to, to record and then to post. You can, if you miss a week, you can still be caught up. And then also I'm gonna try to, I do want you to take your notes, okay? So um, I want you to take notes as if you're studying, but I will post like these single page, these single page summaries from our discussion. So uh, I'll also share this on our ICF group page, but interpreting the word is really where, is really where all our stuff is posted. We hope in the future to have a website we just haven't had the chance yet to, to develop one. So again, no pressure. Maybe you don't want to use it. Maybe you're maybe because of what's happening, you're done with Facebook. Fair enough, you know. Um, but it's just a, an additional tool that that we want to offer to you. Um, turn in your Bibles, please, to Revelation chapter one, verses four to eight. So <laughs> we're doing five verses now, and uh, woohoo! I, I do want to say this. I do want to say this. Revelation is incredibly uh, a hot button topic. There's different frameworks. There's different views on the structure and 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 theological conclusions from Revelation. And so uh, I, I do really want this. I don't want this to be a divisive time. So maybe there'll be some disagreement. And uh, uh, my hope and prayer is number one that that uh, the, the word of God speaks to us, okay? The word of God speaks to us and our theological conclusions should come from the word and not be put upon the word, okay? Now perhaps, for, you, I, I should say, Cigarado, for sure you're going to maybe not agree with everything, okay? Um, Pastor all knows, him and I disagree sometimes, okay? That's fine, all right? Uh, so what we'll try to do is we'll try to sift through the non-negotiables and then in some of the negotiables, and I'll, I'll try to highlight this. I'll try to say like, hey, we should be agreeing on this point and then maybe this point can be debated. Uh, maybe you don't agree, uh, but at least you can see where, where, uh, where people get that, okay? So because I'm, I'm looking at the list, we have a lot of people, and, I, and I'm sure that we have a range of views. I'm sure we have a range of views, okay? So I really wanna, pre I prefaced that last week. I'm gonna continue to preface that and bring that back, that um, at the end of the day, uh, we can agree and disagree in some areas. In many areas, we should agree. I think, I think in many areas, we should agree. For those who were in, in, in the study last week, uh, there was a lot of agreement. And so I just really wanna come back and emphasize that and uh, I will always come back to this. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of the prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and, and, and keep the words of this prophecy because the time is near. And so I am always going to be quoting that, those, those verses, and, and those verses are going to be a guide. We, we must be reading the words of this prophecy out loud, out loud, and we also must be listening and obeying and keeping the words of the prophecy. So I'll go ahead and read uh, the, the passage of scripture and then we'll have a discussion. Uh, Revelation 1 verses 4 to 8, the word of the Lord. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the rulers of the king, the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. 
and he has made us a kingdom, priests to our God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those whom he pierced, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So, phenomenal introduction, uh, phenomenal truths, foundational truths that, that our faith is built upon here. And so we're just going to go line by line like last time and just discuss uh, and come to some conclusions. And I really hope that you're encouraged and that you're also challenged. Okay, so let's look at verse, verse 4. And just like last week, we first want to be asking some questions. We want to be making some observations. And, uh, uh, who's, what's the topic? What is, what is the action? What are descriptions? What are objects? Uh, who's involved? Uh, types of observations and questions like that. So let's go ahead. And, and the other thing, too, is I do want us to be going back. So I'll be referencing, even tonight, this morning, I'll be referencing our, our passage from last week as well, because there's actually some connecting words. So look at verses one to three as well and see if you can see similar connecting words as well or similar concepts, repetitive words. So I'll go ahead and I'm going to open up the floor. And what are your observations and questions? It appears right off the bat, it's almost like um, it's a letter because it's, being, it's basically saying, John to the seven churches that are in Asia, Great. grace to you okay. and peace. There is this letter form idea, and this is concerning uh, genre, right? So we talked about genre a little bit last week. And so there is, there is, uh, he's, he is using a, a, this, this, uh, this, when we say genre, we're just referring to structure. We're referring to structure, okay? So, so it does have this epistle form, although we also talked about the primary genre that John wants it to be viewed as, right? And what is that review? What is that primary genre that John wants his words to be considered as from last week? Anyone? Prophetic? Yes, prophetic. So always keep that in mind. And then also, I think you, you mentioned, uh, Luigi, you mentioned uh, the author and the audience, correct? Is, did you mention that as well? No. Oh, now I'm, you mean? I'm sorry. I just mentioned that was, it's like in a letter format, right? Yeah. Okay, good. All right, great. All right. Anyone else want to add? There's a lot of stuff here. Well, from, from uh, verses 1 and 3, we talked about it going from God to Jesus to angel to John to servants. It has a similar structure here as well. Okay, so for sure we have, we have, we can highlight, let's first highlight, uh, yeah, no, it continues. No, that's good. That's good. So you have, you have here the author, right? Author and the, uh, the audience. And so I'll highlight the author is John. The audience is the churches. The churches. So I'll reference you to the to the handout from last week. But continuing that idea, you have you have John, and then this is going down to churches, right? And in and in verses one to three, who was the one? Who is the one after John? It, for anyone who had it from, from last week. What is the word? He, he doesn't, in verses one to three, doesn't reference churches. What, what's the word that's used there? What, the angel? 
Servants. Servants. That's really important. So in, in one to three, the reference is not church, but servants. Remember, that was a question we had. The question that we had is, who is the servants? And so I mentioned it could be specific, a prophetic, a cat, uh, specific prophets. That's a view. In the Old Testament, the prophets were called the servants of the Lord. Paul calls himself a servant of the Lord in like a special category. And so in verses one to three, we had the question, who are the servants? Are these special leaders? Are they, is this a special, is this a special uh, gift given? Or are the servants, is, is it the church? Okay, so here, does everyone see how in verses one to three, the reference is John is showing then you have you have the uh the angel gives the revelation to john john gives it to servants and now john is writing to churches do you see do you see that do you see that so it almost seems again a tentative conclusion we we, we have to wait to see if this is really confirmed but do you see how we could say oh the churches could be equal to the servants does everyone see that or ask your question if you're missing that. I, I don't want people to miss it. Well, not ne I, I would say not necessarily. It just seems like there are two specific things that they're that John is speaking to. But you're right. I guess they could be the same. But why not use the same word if it was the same? Okay. So, so yeah. So 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 we right. So so we we're called the church. We're called brothers. We're called Christians. So perhaps perhaps it's a different word that's synonymous, or it's two different categories. I take it that it's um, the bond servants, like it's John's included in that in those first three verses. It's to the bond servants, but to John, who is a bond servant as well. Um, so that it, there, it's two bond servants, and now John is writing, and um, he says to the I, church, so I, I just assume it's the people that make up the churches that John's writing to. Yeah, so, no, that, that, that's, that's good. So, let's, yeah, so, to, yeah, okay, so, yeah, so John is explicitly, I just want to double check. So, John is also called a servant, okay? So, um, let's just make, what I'm trying to say is, we don't have a clear answer. I, I hope everyone can see this. This is part of the interpretative process. Um, it does seem to be, it's the same, church is the same as, as, as Amy said. You know, Luigi's not 100% sure, others aren't. It, it's not, what I'm trying to say, it's not black and white yet. So, so let's, let's hold that tentatively. As we study the book, that's a question we want to, to answer. So I hope that you're also seeing in this study how we study the word of God. Sometimes we jump to a conclusion, and then once we jump to a conclusion, it's like, all right, I'm all in. And then you start defending, and that, that could be a wrong conclusion instead of letting the word of God speak to us and really confirm that, okay? So, so let's make this tentative conclusion or at least recognize, um, because it is, going to be, it is going to be significant later when there's other servants mentioned, when there's, when there's specific prophecies mentioned. And so, yeah, so <laughs> some people might be like, oh, well, I want to change my interpretation because I don't like how it's going to go later on. So let's just... Let's, 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 let's keep it. Let's see what happens. Okay. Um, good, good. I think we're, I think we're getting somewhere. All right. What other observations do you have here in verse four? What other observations do you have? There, there are three entities that are being introduced here. Who are they? Um, um, him who is and who was and who is to come. That's one. Um, the second one is the seven spirits, if you know if you can count them as one, and then Jesus Christ. Great. Let me just make a quick fix here. All right, here we go. All right, so we have now. Uh, so we have now. I'm looking at this key word. I, I agree with, with Kuiara'o. There's this key word from. And so from 
describes a, a source, okay? So there's one, source two, and source three. Does everyone see that? Now, what it's coming from a, a group of people and going to, so, so who is the, what is coming from the source? Can someone identify what's coming from the source? The source is giving something. Let's think. Grace. Yeah, okay, great, excellent. So does everyone see that? There's, there's grace and peace. This is an object. So the, sor the sources are giving grace and peace. And, and who is the one receiving the grace and peace? The churches? The seven churches? Yeah, so it's, it's specifically the you, correct? And the you is the seven churches. Right. Okay. All right. Everyone sees that? Everyone sees that? So I want to take a step back. We said this is an epistle, right? So this is an epistolary introduction. We have a grace to you in peace. So what type of statement is this? From your knowledge in, in scripture and epistles, what type of, what do we call this? It's a greetings. Yes, excellent. It's a we can say greeting. Some people will call it salutation. Uh, salutation and greeting is synonymous. Um, so we'll just keep it greeting. I'll just uh -huh. put a S A L uh -huh. there. Period. Uh -huh. So from for everyone from your familiarity with New Testament greetings, what is what is so amazing about, what is so unique to this greeting compared to other greetings? Maybe you want to look at other, uh, other epistles or what jumps out at you that is very uh, interesting about this greeting? Well, he's speaking on behalf of God, Jesus, and seven spirits. Okay, so definitely there's 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 unique there's unique descriptions. Was was that was that uh, who is who is that? Neil. <laughs> Neil, and I, I don't know if I yeah, Neil. It. It's Neil. Yeah. Neil. Okay, no, great. So definitely definitely uh, unique descriptions, right? We haven't seen these kind of descriptions before in other epistles, that they're very unique. Um, th there, is, there, is, there is similarity, so the persons might be the same, but there is definitely, un it's a unique introduction. What else? Think about the three. What is so unique about the three? Three sources? Yeah, there's, there's three sources, and if you look <laughs> at the rest of the New Testament, Epistles. <laughs> a lot of times. Go ahead. Trinity. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, it's the, it's the testimony of all of God together. This is, someone can correct me if I'm wrong. There is no other greeting with all three of them. Most of the time it's from, it's from God the it's from God the Father and Jesus Christ, and I think sometimes it's just God the Father, but, for, but mostly it's, it's God the Father and Jesus Christ, and here you have, uh, you have three, you have three. So, uh, right, so there's three. So this is, this is a proof for, a, for, for the Trinity. Everyone sees that. I mean, the Trinity is presupposed in this greeting, okay? Um, because the Trinity is giving grace, the Trinity is giving peace to the church, all right? Now, uh, with, with the identification, which, which is clear, there, there is this Trinitarian 
uh, uh, because of the, right, we, we just say that's, that's clear, right? So then looking here, we're gonna identify this as what? God. This source is God who? God the Father. The Father. And then what's the next one? Holy Spirit. Okay, uh, the Holy Spirit. And then Son. And then uh, Son of God. God. Oops. I I'm going to add the other gods because I don't want to, I mean, the other <laughs> reference. I, yeah, <laughs> one God, three persons. Okay, I just want to make sure that I'm emphasizing that. The uh, Son. So I just want to make sure it's equal. Now, uh, we, we all identify this, and, and I, want, I want you to look at the number that's being used. What is so interesting, is there a number referenced here? And if so, what strikes you uh, how numbers are being used here? What are the numbers being used? Seven. I heard it. Uh, someone speak up. Be strong. Who was that? Oh, seven. N number seven. The seven spirits. And the okay. seven churches. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> I hope you can appreciate the conclusion we're moving to here, okay? Uh, in the seven churches that are in Asia, for those who have already re read uh, Revelation, how many churches are, are described in Revelation chapter 2 and 3? For those of you who've read Revelation before. Seven. Yeah, so, so here, seven is being used in one, uh, in at least one sense, it's being used literally, right? Okay. <laughs> there are little there are literally seven historic churches. Okay. Now, are there seven holy spirits? <laughs> Does everyone see? Does everyone see the problem here? <laughs> are there seven holy spirits? We, I thought there was only three persons. That, there's actually nine persons. <laughs> Sound heretical. Sorry. Yeah, why is that? Okay, so either either there is either there's seven literal spirits, or seven is not meant to be understood literally. And now the plot thickens. <laughs> so, uh, well, go ahead. I was gonna say. I mean, you can you can say that the seven churches. The people of the church, you know, the servants of the church, they make up one spirit. You want to call it that? One body. Right? Yeah. Because, yeah, like you're saying, there's, we're all one body and we're all from one spirit. Yeah. No, so, so, so this is what I, I'm really pushing here. And maybe, maybe, maybe you want to disagree with me. Fair enough. Um, I think, I think. Uh, our literalistic understanding of numbers in our context, uh, we can't import that back, okay? So uh, otherwise we run into this, this, it could be a heterodox position, okay? So, so what, what um, uh, I have another thought too, though. Don't they talk about the angel? That walk are the angel. Is it one angel that wa walks amongst the candlesticks? That's later on. So That's we're gonna later. That. That's that, the one who okay. walks among the candlesticks is Jesus Christ Himself. So, oh, that's Jesus. Oh, okay. I thought there was okay. Sorry, <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. No, and this is this is I want us to be reading, I want us to be reading Revelation and making connections here. So, this is what I want us to see here, okay? This, uh. Seven is enough. Is is can, seven can be used literally, and it can be used figuratively. Okay, 
Seven can be used literally and figuratively, not just in Revelation, but throughout all of Scripture. Uh, and it's used in the ancient, con in the ancient whether, you, whether you say ancient Near East, whether you say um, in, uh, in antiquities, however you want to use it. Seven is the number seven, and, and numbers are used literally and figuratively. And, and I, what I want us to see here is that when John, John, John is highlighting because he writes to seven churches, okay? But what we're going to see is the seven churches are representative of the complete church, okay? So that those, those it, it's not just for the seven churches, but it's for the church itself. And we would all agree with that. I mean, we, we just do that subconsciously. We, we apply the epistles, whether, whether an epistle is written to the Corinthian believers or the Ephesians, we recognize that, that those truths are, are beyond the, that church itself, okay? So what I want us to see, though, is that if uh, seven here, uh, seven here is not literal. This is figurative. If we hold to one God, three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you cannot take seven spirits to be literally. If, if you see fullness, you can see fullness or even perfect. The, the idea of seven can also be uh, fullness or perfection. Then it's the perfect spirit that's before the throne. You see that? It's, it's, it's not, seven is not being used literally. So, you, so why did they use seven then? I'm confused. Because seven in the ancient Near East was a sign of perfection or completion. So for example. Is this like the seven days of a week? Kind of. Now it's just kind of, I'm going farther, but. Yeah. So it can be, it can be, it can be, it, it's often literal and figurative, Ati Maritas. Um, so for, so for example, um, I'll try to give a, a parallel example. Um, uh, no, I'll give it, I'll give it in, in Jesus, right? So, 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 P, so Peter asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? And Jesus says seven times 70. Okay. And so if we're reading that literally on the, 491st time we don't have to forgive <laughs> right <laughs> if a brother sins 491 times no no need to forgive right but that's only reading the numbers literally if we if we understand what it signifies seven times 70 is no you forgive him limitlessly there is no and we always say that seven is the Lord's number. That's the most common uh, idea among us Christians. And incidentally, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are also seven. And there's a lot of uh, uh, figuratively or literal, yeah. you can apply with the word seven, the sevenfold amen. Uh, the, well, it's not in the Bible. <laughs> so here's what's going to be crazy. There's, there, this is what's going to be crazy, okay? There's actually seven blessed statements in Revelation. <laughs> so, so what we're going to see is that this number of seven is not. Now there is there is there is literalness in its use, but it doesn't have to be literal. It, 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 the greater significant literal usage is the is the spiritual significance. Okay, is everyone tracking with me there? So yes, sir. Okay, I I I hope that we're not I, I hope that we're not making it more complicated than it is. I just want us to see that seven can be used literally, or it can be used figuratively, or it can be used both. Okay. Um, could I add a little bit, Tim? This is Mila. Yeah, go ahead. yeah both are lit uh, we could use both, but I would like to say that is also a symbolism. It's a big symbol because as we talk about uh, revelation. Uh, we later on we will see so much a symbol uh, with that. So when we say um, seven, we look back at the days of the creation. Uh, we know that the first, uh, it is seven, it's completion on the seventh day. 
So when we look into this, this is the actions of God, the, the symbolism, the number seven, so that the action of God towards created order. Yep. And we are part of that created order. It's the very actions of God. We could see as well too, that, uh, that when uh, God promises uh, Noah that he will no longer um, flooded the whole world, the whole creation at that time, there's a rainbow. And if we look at that rainbow, the only visible color to the created eyes of human eyes without all of the, uh, when we use the prism, are seven main color. I so uh, I'll, I'll have to think about that. That's really interesting. I did not know that. That's very interesting, yeah. So what I mean here is just like, yeah. So it is a symbolism that yeah, it could be literal. It could be like, uh, uh, it, it has a meaning. But let's think about that, that this is the one who I'm talking about is God. God is acting. God has an action. Yeah. And this action is grace and peace towards the seven churches. Yeah. So then if we look back to parallel, who is really this God, God the Father, how he is acting. Yeah. So we could really see even before the creation or during that creation. Yeah. Well, that's, so that's, 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 that's my, my thought of that. So excuse me yeah. that, that's, for a minute. That's good. That's good. So, yeah, I, I think drawing everything back, just also picking up what Mila said, you have seven, you have seven, uh, seven seals, you have seven trumpets, you have, you have, you have the, seven is used a lot in, in Revelation. There's going to be other numbers used. What I want to emphasize, I want to bring it back to very specifics, okay? Numbers are used literally, but also figuratively. So simply in our interpretative process, simply arguing for a literal use of a number, uh, that's, no, <laughs> that's no longer valid. We have to look at the context. We have to look at the, the symbolism and what's being used because clearly here, seven, seven is used literally and figuratively. So simply asserting, oh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a number seven, so it has to always be literal. What I'm trying to say is that as we read Revelation, we, can, we can't use that. That's not an appropriate uh, basis or fact. Both are Amen. possible, okay? Great. All right, I, we're getting somewhere. All right, let, let's, let's uh, time, is, time, is fly, time is flying here. So let me just make several more highlights and then we're going to move on to verse five. Um, uh, this description here of God the Father, the one who is, who was, and is to come, is focusing upon his self existence and eternality. The one, it doesn't say the one who was and is and is to come. It's the one who is and who was and is to come. Meaning to say that this is coming back and, and really uh, we don't have time to go there. But if, we're, if you want a, an Old Testament passage to study, uh, Exodus, Exodus chapter 3. And, and the name of the Lord, Yahweh, um, I am who I am. Uh, this also signifies self-existence, eternality, then also all-powerfulness. And you might say, Tim, wh why is there all-powerfulness being referenced or implied in this who is, who was, and is to come? Uh, the reason why this is so... Uh, this signifies incredible power is that every one of us depends on something else for our existence. We depend on food. We depend on social relationships. We depend on many different factors. Every part of creation depends on some type of outside factor or fuel or something in order for it to exist. The earth depends on the sun. Uh, stars depend on the breaking down of of, of atoms, okay? There's only one entity, one being in the universe that absolutely does not need anything outside of himself to exist. And if that is the case, it signifies a being that is 
in, of incredible, infinite power. So you might say, who is, who was, who is to come, you know, I'm just thinking about presence. But, but, but no, there is this, there is this presence, self-existence, but there is also this all-powerfulness. The being has to be all-powerful to continue to exist apart from anything else. And then that comes to the third point, this authority. Any being that exists of his own power has the authority. <laughs> Anyone, anything that exists on its own and has that incredible power, nothing else in the universe has it. There's nothing else in the universe that has it. Uh, there is this idea of authority, incredible authority, uh, uh, unparalleled authority. So throughout the Old Testament, the name of the Lord, uh, uh, many times throughout the Old Testament, in judgment, the judgment of Egypt, in the, in the prophetic oracles in Ezekiel and Isaiah, judgment comes, and then the statement is, the judgment is coming so that you or so that they will know that I am the I am, <laughs> that I am the Lord. Okay, so whenever you see this word in the Old Testament, the Lord, it comes back to this, this self-existence so that everyone will know that I am the I am. Okay, everyone's tracking with me. So this is actually the climax of who God is, the full revealing of who God is. Okay, this statement, who is, who was, and is to come. It's incredibly powerful. Statement. Tim? Yeah, go ahead. Tim? I was, just, I was just thinking about when Jesus was before Pilate and Pilate was threatening him, saying, You know, don't you realize that I, what I can do to you? And Jesus said, It's only because my father gave you the ability to do it that you can do it. No, excellent. No, that's it, there's someone with a greater authority than you, brother. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> really good. No, that's a great connection. And, and that becomes, so I'm going to piggyback Silvio's comment. That's more significant when Jesus says, I am. Because Jesus is saying, I, I have that same power. I have that same existence. I have that same authority. And that really challenges anyone who wants to say that Jesus is a lower God. Now, Jesus doesn't say, in this passage, I'm referring to in John when he calls himself the I am. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, let, let's move on to verse number five now. Verse number five. So uh, verse number five really unfolds uh, the third person here. Uh, what do you notice the descriptions of Jesus? What are the descriptions of, of Jesus here? I don't understand the firstborn of the dead. <laughs> yeah, it indicates that he was human. Um, oh, I have... It says, he said that Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, because he's the first one who died and, and, and go through to that, you know, uh, and then rose again. He is the only one, nobody else but him, the only witness of to die and be risen. He is the only one. There's nobody else. It just says he is the only witness. So, so, so let's focus first on this firstborn of the dead. So, Atimari Tess, you said that he's the first one to die and to come alive. Uh, yes. That's, that's, that, that, let's tweak that a little bit because, because right, Lazarus died and came back, right? Uh, there were several that died and came back, right? So what, so let's, I agree with you that he, that he, he's the first one to die and to, to come back. To sacrifice and come back. But there, but there's a third component here at the Mari test, right? Because if he just comes back to life, he'll die again, right? There's many people that have been resurrected from the dead in scripture that then died again. But he did not. He did not. He rose and went to heaven. He's the only one who did that. Nobody did. 
he, he Jesus uh, rose the dead the the dead from the dead yeah. like Lazarus, but he did it. But for him, nobody but him may you know died and went through that, went to hell, and he is the does it says he or the third one he says he is the prince. Where is that now? I forgot. He is the prince of the kings of the earth. So, so Atimaritas, let, let me just fill in. So you're correct. He, he, he was the first one that, that, that died, came back to life, and went to heaven. He didn't die again. But he did no. die again, and the reason is incorruptible. He's the, yes. he's the, he's the, the firstborn of the dead of the new creation. Of the new creation. Uh, the first the first person who escapes the curse of Adam. That's why he's the firstborn of the dead. What's being implied here is this is the Adamic curse. And so he is the first one that comes back. Many other people came back to life. He came back, uh, Romans 1, 5, uh, Romans 1, 1 to 5. For those of you who want to study this more on your own, Declared to be the Son of God in power from the uh, by the resurrection uh, through the power uh, through, through the, the, the 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 Spirit of Holiness with power. Okay, so 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 this is the the firstborn of the new creation. The firstborn of the new creation. The firstborn of the new creation. Uh, you're going to. But the homework for you is to read the vision, the first vision that, that John sees of the exalted, risen, glorified Jesus Christ. What is it again? The, 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 the risen, exalted, glorified Jesus Christ. There's a uh, uh, Revelation 1, 9 to 20. That's your homework assignment for next week. Read the vision. Uh, 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 look at who Jesus has become. So this is huge, right? It's, 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 it's an incredible description of what Jesus has done, okay? So that's the first significance I, we, want, we, we want to see. The, the next is, uh, Ati Marites mentioned the faithful witness. Where have we seen this before? He bore witness to the word of God. Jesus, yeah, so, so, he, so John bore witness to the, to the testimony of Jesus Christ, right? John did this, but now we're seeing uh, the description of the testimony of Jesus Christ. That is that Jesus was the faithful witness, the one who came to earth and bore witness to the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the light. <laughs> the truth Right, this is all in this courtroom setting. Because look at how critical this is. God's judgment in Revelation is coming upon the earth. And there's going to be no excuse of, we didn't know. We didn't know. They knew because there was a faithful witness who came and proclaimed the truth. And we're going to see what they did to him. Right? So that, again, coming back, Revelation is describing this cosmic uh, courtroom in which God is, is, is going to, dis, to, to declare a verdict. And then he's going to send out the judgment. Okay? So we see that here. So Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, right? The one declaring the truth. The, the firstborn of the new creation. So the truth, being a faithful witness, he's declaring the truth. The truth is here. It, it, it lived among us, right? Number two, we have assurance he's the firstborn of the new creation. It's, it's, it's no longer a promise. It's in reality, all right? And then number three, he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. To who he is the fulfillment.
Now, yeah, so he's the fulfillment for sure, Ati Martes, for sure. Now, is this is this kingship future or is it present? I, I'm thinking now, looking at other New Testament passages, is this kingship only future or is it, is it present now? The, the text to me seems to be saying it's present, but let's confirm that. Do Is there any passage of scripture that would suggest that Jesus is king of the rulers of the earth now? Does anyone have a passage that you that comes to your mind? What about Matthew 28? Ah. Ah. He said, all authority has been given unto me. Where? Which what? authority and where? In heaven and in earth, right? Yeah. That's, Jesus is the king. He is at the right hand of God reigning now. That doesn't mean that he is going to come and to reign in earth in its fullness. Absolutely does not, does not deny that future possibility. But, but now he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. And we know that because when he gave the great commission, he said all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. <laughs> So it's not a future giving of the authority. It's a present. It's actually a, at the point of the Great Commission, it's already past tense, has been given. Okay? Everyone see that? Everyone think about that. All right. Time is... I just, I just want to be clear on the firstborn of the dead. What it means is like when he resurrected, he has the glorified body, the, the incorruptible body that we will become when we see him again. Yes. Is that? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. yes. We shall be like him. Yes, exactly. Yes. So, so it's not referring to his, the, the son of God nature. It's referring to him, uh, uh, Jesus Christ exalted uh, new creation. Yeah. And, and after after his resurrection, yes. where, where he can where, where he can just morph anywhere he wants. Yes, exactly, exactly. Okay. No, that's, yeah, exactly. Okay, let's move on here. Time is time is fleeting from us. Look now at his action. So this here, I'll just highlight this. Uh, to him is a. There's going to be something given to him to him so he's going to receive something and it's restated here okay so we're gonna we're gonna look at what that is uh i'll just highlight through here because we're running out of time we, we're, we're running out of time here and I, I want us to finish this look at the work of jesus so we have this is jesus is i want to say one other thing here uh this here is a reference to messiah so this is jesus the Jewish Messiah, the anointed one of God. Okay, so we, always when you see Christ, just think anointed one of God, fulfilling the promises given to Israel. We just have to, we have to remember that, okay? Now look at the actions. Who is this Jesus Christ? What, he's a faithful witness. He's the firstborn of the dead. He's the rulers of the kings of the earth. What type of actions has he done for us? Number one, he is the one who loves us. Number two, he is the one who has freed us, freed us, saved us, rescued us from our sins by his blood. So this is a reference to uh, fulfillment. Yeah, fulfillment. So, but but think about this for a second. We talked about his blood and sacrifice. For, we're going to make a connection with Hebrews now. Uh, what is the blood? What covenant is the blood connected to from our book? From the book in Hebrews. Blood connected. Um, the sacrifice. Sacrifice. 
But is this not the new covenant? The book of Hebrews in our, from our study stress this to no end. The, 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 the blood of the first of, of bulls could never take away sins. Yes. It's, it's the blood of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a person, uh, of not any person, a sinless person who is God. <coughs> and that blood is the sacrifice of the new covenant. Christ, Jesus is the high priest of the new covenant. Okay, so there's a lot of, uh, when he, he has freed us from our sins by his blood, what is going on behind here is the new covenant. Every first Sunday of the month, we celebrate the new covenant mm -hmm. in the Lord's Supper. Yes. Every, every Sunday, we celebrate the blood of Jesus in the cup, the body, mm -hmm. in the new covenant. Okay? Now, what's the third thing? What is the third thing that he has made? Not only has he loved us, not only has he freed us from our sins. It's amazing, right? But more importantly, he has made us a kingdom. A kingdom. A kingdom. A place. A place. A kingdom. So, a place in heaven. It's a kingdom priest to his God. So, so I, I'm going to read a passage of scripture for us. Let, let's go to um, let's go to Exodus chapter 19, verse six. Everyone, turn in their Bibles to Exodus. Exodus what? Exodus 19, verses. Uh, let's begin in verse. I'm going to begin in verse one. We're we're going to focus on verses uh, five and six. Okay, I'm going to set the context for us. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai. They encamped, camped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain. While Moses went up to God, the Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be a, my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. <laughs> right, so that's kingship. That's authority. The earth is mine. <laughs> Watch. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. That's a reference to Israel. What is John saying to him, to Jesus, the Son of God, the Jewish Messiah, who loves us and freed us from our sins through his blood, new covenant, and made us a kingdom? <laughs> Priest to his God and Father. What is, John, what, is, what is John revealing to us? This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation of, of Jesus, the Messiah. What is he saying here? What, ki what kind of kingdom was Israel? throughout the whole Old Testament. Were they a good kingdom? Were they good priests? <laughs> to God? No. Pardon my French, but they sucked royally. They were the, the, the suckiest priests ever. Right? The whole point of the Old Testament was that they were, they were such a bad kingdom they were sent into exile. God's judgment came upon them. They were sent into exile. And then God sends his son, who is the Jewish Messiah, and he's freed us. Now, what I, I want to be clear here. What I'm not saying is that Israel failed, Israel's done, and now, and now uh, the church is replacing Israel. I'm not saying that, okay? 
also Tim. In in First Peter two nine, it says, "But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light." So, does that mean that all believers are now priests in, yes, Jesus, in Jesus? Yes, it does. And so here's the big takeaway. Watch this. This is the big takeaway. Okay. Um, uh, um, the church is the people of the Messiah. Jesus says that, right? Uh, let's go really quick. Just, just to be clear, just so that you see that I'm not, I'm not, uh, Matthew 16. Let's go to Matthew 16, verse 17. Everyone look up here on the screen. Blessed are you, Simon Bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my people. I will build my church. So Jesus, the Son of God, the Jewish Messiah, says, I will build my people on this rock, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I will give to you the, key, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound on heaven. Whatever you loose on earth whatever will be loosed in heaven. So, uh, and then, and then uh, Peter says, according to 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 1 Peter 2, 9, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. A Does he say kingdom there or no? Just royal priesthood. Royal priesthood. Yeah, but Holy the, nation. Yeah, but remember, a ro royal priesthood is, royal is king. <laughs> royal is king, is kingly reference. So, so Peter's reference here, royal priesthood is the same thing. Now, what I am saying is, as Atimarit has said, uh, this is the fulfillment. This is the fulfillment, not a replacement. So in the church, you have Christ is the head. The church is his body. And the church is made up of Jews. and Gentiles, Jews and Gentiles, by faith. What connects us to Christ is by faith. Is everyone tracking with me what's going on here? Any questions or comments? I hope everyone's seeing this. It's powerful. You're out of time and we're not finished. We're going to have to continue this next week. I, I don't want to rush this because there's so much truth, but we'll go quicker than this. I, I do want to add one more thing and then I'll turn it over to back to pastor. Um, uh, this here is a doxology. Doxology, dox means to glory. And doxologies are only given to God. But the hymn is Jesus. To him be glory, dominion forever and ever. Amen. So this is thoroughly a Trinitarian divinity of Christ reference. It's all. If you have friends or family that, that does not hold to the divinity and equality of Jesus with God the Father, they don't hold to a orthodox view of Trinity, this is all over Revelation uh, chapter 1, verses 4 to 6. Jesus is God. To him be glory, dominion forever and ever. That's only given to God the Father and also to Jesus if he is God. <laughs> Amen. Okay, so I hope that we can see this here. I am going to end it here because verses 7 and 8 is, again, just full of just deep theology. I don't want to rush it. Uh, remember, John is setting up the context for what is to come. So we can, if ever, uh, we cannot rush these beginning verses because this is giving us deep truth by which we're going to then unpack later. So we'll end it in verse six. And um, maybe I'll post some other passages of scripture for you to contemplate. Uh, 
I hope that we can see, uh, number one, the Trinitarian God is for us. Grace and peace versus wrath and judgment. Notice that. Wrath and judgment is coming throughout the rest of the book. So coming back to here, instead of wrath and judgment, we have grace and peace. Think about that. Wrath mm -hmm. and judgment is going to be a huge, the primary topic, the wrath and judgment of God. But it, before it happens, grace and peace to the churches. Amen. To, uh, to him who loves us and freed us and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And the last thing I just want to note here before I give it over is dominion is a reference to kingdom. And think about this. Jesus is the final Adam. Adam was called to, to glorify God, and he was called to have dominion, take dominion of the earth. Now we see Jesus, the firstborn from the dead, overcoming, overcoming the Adamic curse, and he's receiving glory. He's receiving glory and kingdom forevermore. So what I what I'll Last thing, I'm sorry, but all the problems that were created in Genesis 1 to 3 and Genesis 1 to 11, we are beginning to see. <laughs> we're going to see the tree of life coming back. We're going to see life come back. We're going to see God's presence coming back. So from garden to garden, from garden to garden, and John is setting the table for us here. The final Adam is going to be bringing us back to the garden. And with that, I'll turn it back to Pastor.